Two years ago today at 9.15am, a few million people in Southeast Australia realised that earthquakes are a thing in Australia too. A lot has happened since then, so let's cover a few of the more interesting points about the earthquake at Woods Point. This earthquake was a moment magnitude of 5.9, but the equivalent Richter magnitude of this earthquake was a 6.0. It's the largest earthquake ever recorded in Victoria, and it's the largest earthquake within 150 kilometres of a capital city since the magnitude 6.5 earthquake that destroyed Meckering in 1968, about 110 kilometres east of Perth in Western Australia. The epicentre was about halfway between Mount Buller and Mount Borbore, two popular ski destinations in the Victorian Alps, mountains formed by millions of earthquakes over millions of years. Despite being initially reported to have occurred at Mansfield, the epicentre was over 50 kilometres to the southeast, near the town of Woods Point. The initial earthquake waves took about 20 seconds to reach Melbourne, followed 15 seconds later by strong shaking waves that rattled buildings for 20 to 30 seconds. The earthquake was felt in Hobart to the south, in Adelaide to the west, and to the north in Sydney and even in Queensland up to 1400 kilometres from the epicentre. That's because earthquake energy waves travel further where the crust is older and more dense, which is the case in Australia, which is a relatively stable area in the middle of a tectonic plate. There was very little damage in Woods Point and the surrounding towns, but 130 kilometres away in Melbourne, the lower frequency energy waves resonated in some areas, causing chimneys to topple, along with an unreinforced masonry wall in a normally busy area of Paran. Fortunately, the streets were almost empty due to Melbourne's COVID lockdown, likely saving people from injury or worse. The fault that ruptured during the earthquake was a strike slip fault, which is a less common type of fault in our region. In this case, the fault aligned with the southwest to northeast compressional stress, rather than the more common reverse faults that we see in Australia that are aligned across a stress field, where earthquakes can create an uplifted scarp above the fault. The rupture area for a magnitude 6 earthquake is about 100 square kilometres, or 10 kilometres long by 10 kilometres deep. But because this earthquake originated around 13 kilometres below the surface, there was no obvious rupture visible at the surface. In the two years prior to the earthquake, there are only five earthquakes within 20 kilometres of the main shock's epicentre. But since then, we've had around 1,600 aftershocks, and we're still seeing around 15 aftershocks every month. It's not uncommon for the largest aftershock in a sequence to be about a magnitude unit smaller than the main shock. And the largest aftershock to date occurred only three months ago, a magnitude 4.7. It's the only aftershock large enough to be felt in Melbourne. Aftershocks will likely continue for years, but they will reduce in frequency and magnitude as time goes on. But there's always a chance of a larger aftershock, so be ready to drop cover and hold on if you feel strong shaking. In a crazy coincidence, on the one year anniversary of this earthquake, at exactly the same minute as the original earthquake, we had a small aftershock. The SRC's Twitter live broadcast immediately following the main earthquake reached about half a million people. And that's what motivated me to start making more of these signs communication videos, which I hope has helped people become more aware of earthquakes in Australia and how we can be better prepared for them.